Okay, so my name's Simon Duffy. I run the Centre for Welfare Reform, which is a Sheffield-based independent think tank. Um, and I'm also one of the leaders of Citizen Network, which is a global cooperative to help grow a movement for inclusion, equality, and appreciation of human diversity. Um, and I'll share links. If you're interested in either of those things, you can subscribe to the Centre's newsletter and you can join Citizen Network. It's free to join. Uh, a growing global movement for inclusion. Uh, I've been, since, since the COVID thing began, I seem to have been hosting a lot of webinars um, and often having the great chance to introduce friends and people I admire. But this is an extra special event for me, I've got to say. John and Francis are two of my oldest friends, colleagues, collaborators, two of my heroes and um, I think it is relevant to tell a little bit of the long story of our work together to set the scene for um, the New Way Home publication and for some of the key messages that they're going to share. So um, I met John first um, when he was on a, a, a kind of study tour uh, in preparation for the closure plans for Lennox Castle Hospital. For those of you who don't know, Lennox Castle Hospital was one of the largest institutions um, which kind of incarcerated people with learning difficulties uh, north of Glasgow. Um, and it was John's job to um, develop the plans and to start the, well, the next phase, the biggest key phase of the total closure of Lennox Castle Hospital. And he was visiting um, the organization I worked for in London, which was called Southern Consortium, which was an organization that had been set up um, in really the first phase of deinstitutionalization. So the consortium was set up on the back of the closure of Downth Park Hospital from in Kent, which was the first big institution to close in the United Kingdom. Um, so the consortium services were uh, good by the standards of the time. People were supported in ordinary homes, uh, but a lot of it was still um, what we might call group living. But John was coming to visit some of the work that I was leading around supported living and person-centered planning and individualized funding that we'd started in the early 90s. Our, our experience was that really that the kind of first wave deinstitutionalization into really different forms of residential care um, was still far too institutional. That We were really not respecting the rights of people with learning difficulties or disabled people generally. Uh, and that that was causing, not only was that wrong in its own right, I think, it was just wrong thing to do, but it inevitably causes other problems in personal dissatisfaction for people, for staff, um, problems, sometimes challenging behavior, conflict, um, depression, uh, and so we were starting to work away in the in very early kind of innovations around saying, well, actually, let's try a concept of supported living. Let's say everybody really needs their own home. Supported living wasn't then just another term for group living. It really meant you had your own home, your own housing rights. You chose who you lived with. If you didn't want to live with other people with disabilities, that was fine. And if you did, you all chose together who you lived with. You could live, you could get support in lots of different ways. Um, so it was lovely to meet John. I remember it very, very vividly, but there was a, also kind of like a slight shock when I turned up in Lennox Castle Hospital in 1995, looking for a job and uh, to discover there was John again. And, um, but that, that was really the beginning of a, a, of a long friendship. And what I learned about John was that he was a man of like the deepest integrity Whatever John said to you, he meant. And um, I turned up in a kind of foolish way saying, well, I want to help close these institutions. And he said, well, sorry, Simon, you've kind of missed the boat on that. We have the, the jobs of people whose job it is to close the institutions have kind of gone. Um, but what we really need is a new service provider. Um, and we particularly need somebody who's willing to work in a more individualized way with people. And so that led to the development of Inclusion Glasgow, uh, which was the organization that I set up with Francis to design individualized support from the get-go. 
not moving people out of institutions into group homes and then trying to make things better, but actually saying right from the beginning, we need to move people into a home of their own, treat them as citizens, respect their rights to personal control and autonomy, provide support that's personalized to them, help them recruit the staff they need. Um, really challenging, uh, very groundbreaking work at the time. At the time, I thought it was we were the only people doing it, but actually I discovered at the same time, Patty Scott, almost exactly the same time in New Hampshire, was, was doing exactly the same model. So, that, so there's obviously a wave of people realising this was the right approach to uh, closing institutions. Uh, I'd met Francis because I was one of the trainers on the first person-centred planning training course in Scotland. Uh, which was hosted by Scottish Human Services. And Francis was one of the like, talented folk who were kind of the new wave of, of people learning how to do more person-centered creative thinking around how we design support, helping people to get their lives um, on track, define their own goals, their own objectives, uh, and to negotiate from more with a greater sense of power what it was they really wanted. I was so lucky that Francis agreed to come and work for me, with me, because so many times Francis saved my bacon. I mean, I was, um, yeah, I was often out of my depth, if I'm honest. I was very young. Um, I had great dreams and uh, it was the most stressful thing I'd ever done really to get, to try and do this, which, you know, you're surrounded by people who the system says, that, no, you can't do this. This isn't the way you do things. I remember Francis at one point telling me to stop going up to Lennox Castle Hospital because I was just winding up all the staff. Um, so, uh, you know, many times she, she, uh, she, took, she did the hard yards, really, um, and a very practical and creative thinker and a very good manager. Uh, and so she took over Inclusion Glasgow from me, although sometimes she kicks me for doing that to her and I went on to try and get encourage local authorities to adopt this kind of approach which we called self-directed support why don't we actually treat everybody in social care like this why doesn't everybody have a resource entitlement that can be designed flexibly it makes sense for the people who are most challenging in the system but it also makes sense for people who you know they just need a little bit of assistance but why don't they they design that assistance in a way that makes sense to them, makes sense to their family, makes sense to their citizenship and their community. And I started working in North Lanarkshire Council, which is a local authority next to um, Glasgow, where John, meanwhile, had gone and set up support for ordinary living. So John had, had uh, put his money where his mouth was. After overseeing the deinstitutionalisation process, he, he started creating a new support provider, an excellent organisation in North Lanarkshire. Um, John also went on to create Neighbourhood Networks, which was, um, or take over that, which was like the Scottish version of uh, Carl Pohl's idea, Key Ring, which is again a really great social innovation. John and I also worked on um, creating um, Values into Action Scotland, which was part of Values into Action England, and uh, actually is the only remaining part because we had to break away, didn't we, John, because the English bit didn't understand that Scottish. Scotland had different law and different policy. It was kind of an interesting process in the, for me as an Englishman, seeing what happens when organizations in England don't recognize that, that countries have their own authority and their own history and their own policies. So we've continued to work together. Later on, John and Francis became the leaders of In Control Scotland and took on the ideas of personal budgets um, and um, have continued to do great work in Scotland and really hold the torch for doing this stuff right from the get-go. And I guess that's really what this is all about for us. So there's so much learning through the years, but that, ha that learning does not seem to have really uh, become normalised. And I think I was so encouraged that so many people want to come today, so maybe that's a sign that things are changing and people are starting to get ready to make the next wave of changes because we need this stuff to be normal, not special. It should be normal that everybody's treated as an individual with respect, that everybody has power and control over their own support and they've designed things around what works for people. So on that, I'm gonna first hand over to John Dalrymple. John will then 
guide us through and we'll flick back with some films and some slides. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Simon. Um, <clears throat> it's quite interesting to relive the last, the second half of your life in five minutes there. So thank you for that introduction uh, to both of us. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak to so many people about our, our new publication. Um, we had an English version of the publication about four years ago, and it's, it's interesting, as Simon said, we didn't get much traction for that. So this Scottish version has certainly um, aroused interest, and um, it may just be that, that this is a topic that people really want to tackle this time. So I'm going to share some slides, first of all, and bear with me while I bring them up. Here we go. Um, so um, that's the book, and that's Francis and I um, in our glamorous uh, media photographs. This is the overall structure of the book. Um, it's in five sections. Um, apologies for the kind of hackneyed metaphor, um, but it, just to give us a structure, First part, compass, second part, destination, third part, vehicle, fourth part, roadmap, and the fifth part, passport. And hopefully that'll become clear as we, as we go through. So the first part is compass, and it's about us really trying to get our bearings before we embark on this kind of work. Uh, what, what's all this about? Why is this an important issue? Where are we starting from? Um, and I think for ourselves, I'm just going to move these small pictures to the bottom, I think. Yeah. So for ourselves, um, there are three main starting points. One is that there is still, sadly, a huge amount of segregation, separation and dislocation for all sorts of people for all sorts of reasons across the world. People taken out of their own communities and moved away somewhere for some reason. Um, and uh, for no good reason, usually. So people, people without a home, perhaps we should think of them as homeless. Um, so there's that fact, and then there's the, the disastrous, disastrous effects that that fact has on people, what it does to people's lives, what it does to people's uh, physical welfare, what it does to people's emotional and mental welfare. And the third uh, starting point is we all have some sort of responsibility, we think, to do something about it. And whether that's at an individual level, just as a person, or at a society level as a, a citizen, or, and lots of us here today are professionals in health and social care, What's our responsibility to do something about this? And that, that's, that's part of the challenge of the, the publication. So we're appealing here to a kind of basic humanity. Um, we're appealing or insisting upon the equal human rights of the individuals concerned. And we're also kind of wanting to recognise and, and emphasise that what we're actually talking about here is recognised as best practice. So why are we not doing it? Why don't we do it consistently? Or why consistently do we still send people away um, in the face of the evidence about be best practice? So the first part then we wanted just to, to touch on is um, about our, our basic humanity, that we've all got more in common than we have that, that differentiates us. And of course, we're all uh, gloriously diverse and unique individuals. Our individuality is important. But at the same time, um, we all come from the same place as human beings. Um, so whether, whether it's Emerson and the way he describes what those basic human needs are, 
um, from physiological through to self-actualization, or whether it's um, the philosopher from Sheffield and the way he would describe it in terms of the keys to citizenship on the, the left-hand side of the, the screen there, that the, these are basic human needs, whoever we are, wherever we are, at whatever time in our lives we, 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 we may be thinking about. We all need home and life, life, love and life and help and money and freedom and purpose. Um, and one of the thrusts of the publication is that our common humanity is not compromised by any disadvantage we have, nor is it or should it be compromised by any additional help or support we may require in our lives. In Scotland, we might say, um, we might say, we wouldn't say it very often, but we'd say sometimes we're all Jock Tamson's bairns, meaning just what we said, that we, we we all share a common humanity. Um, and what, we're, what, what, what one, of the, one of the thrusts of the book as well is to say that we don't really have special needs. We all have common hum, human needs. Some of us may need more help um, than other people to ensure that those needs are met. And that might occur for any of us at any time in our lives. But it's not, it's not the needs that are special. It might be the help that we get that is special. So emphasizing the, the, the common humanity there. But if that common humanity is a fact, then if we're all Jock Tansen's bairns, we really need to make sure that all those bairns are treated equally and need to insist on, on that happening. Our modern expressions of human rights come from about 70 years ago in the aftermath of the Holocaust, when we had the extremes of genocide and ethnic cleansing and eugenics. Uh, and out of that came the human rights um, declarations and, and legislation that we're, we're familiar with now. Um, at root, they insist that every human life is valuable, that no human life is more or less valuable than any other and that no person is ever anything less than fully human. So why are we, why are we emphasizing this? I guess it's because a lot of the people who get sent away seem to be understood as being different, perhaps not being fully human, not um, attracting the same rights or sense of humanity that, that other people have. So we, we all have an equal value in status, and that is confirmed with interna within international and domestic law. It is illegal to treat me as less than human or less significant than other human beings. And quite an important thing to get your head around, it took me a while to get my head around, it is the distinction between uh, decision-making capacity and legal capacity. So many people who are sent away from home are deemed to lack capacity and therefore it seems to follow that they will have less, fewer rights in their lives or less access to um, ordinary living. So what, what the concept of legal capacity says is that all the rights that the human rights legislation says are mine still hold true, whatever the extent of my decision-making capacity. So, We've, we've thought about the, the basic humanity of this, that, that we, we all have the same need for a home of our own and a life um, in our own community. We've thought about the, the human rights angle of it. And then thirdly, as we suggested, there is the basic thing about what makes for good practice and good outcomes for people. Um, this is a, a Jim Mansell quote here from 2011. So it's already 10 years ago, post Winterbourne, it's, it's about the wrong model of care. So if we know that it's the wrong model of care, if we know that government policy for nearly 20 years, so now read 30 years, has told local health and social services that people with learning disabilities behavior was challenging, uh, needed 
good local community services, if we know that, why do we continue to practice as though we didn't know that? Um, so that's that's the introduction. That's that's the bit in the book which is about us getting our bearings, um, understanding what our motivation is to do this as people, as citizens, as professionals. Um, and I'm going to pass on to Frances now. She's going to tell us about an individual uh, person who can maybe illustrate some of these points for us. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you all so very much for coming. If you know us, it's nice to see you again. And if you don't, it's nice to meet you for the first time. And as Simon said, it, um, hopefully it's the beginning of a conversation and with everybody and um, Simon, you can come and do our introductions to everything we do, please. <laughs> that was amazing. And um, I suppose that the important thing to just remember is how important you were. <laughs> because I was sitting there with my mute on um, to us in that work. And I suppose it made me think about collaboration and working together and the strength when we do work together. So maybe an important point about 163 people sitting in the chat room as well. So what I've, I wanted to do is just at this point, take a wee moment and, and introduce Huey. Now, Huey is somebody that um, Simon and I and John both know, and we have known now for some 25 years, probably, maybe, maybe a bit longer than that. And he's um, someone who we met through the work that we were doing at Inclusion Glasgow and through the hospital closure programme. Um, that Simon described earlier. And I suppose the thing about Huey, and you know, he's going to, he's, there's a wee bit of film that Huey's going to share his views in a moment about his humanity. And I think we felt that would be really useful here. But we also thought it might be useful just to share his story, because his story is one of 25 years of living in the community now. Now, that's a story where when we met Huey, he had been in institutional care and life, his whole life. He was born in Lennox Castle Hospital. He went, lived in various um, uh, foster homes or children's homes and found himself back in Lennox Castle Hospital because he had became more and more challenging within that system and had really quite a big reputation. And um, by the time we were asked to try and kind of work with, with Huey, um, and think about how we might help them get out of Lennox Castle Hospital. So the, the challenge at the time, I think, for, from Huey's point of view, was he also had um, a very strong voice. I think he did have a clear picture of what, about what he wanted in his life. He had um, relationships and those were important to him and he wasn't going to fit in to any of those kind of tr more traditional services that were still being uh, designed and developed at that time with people maybe living together in, in group homes and so he was very very clearly letting I think everybody that was involved know that he needed something different so we were lucky enough to meet him and spend time with him and work out you know how, how would we help him think about what he wanted what would that look like and I suppose we started on that journey really with him and we supported him and his girlfriend actually to move in to their own home together and as Simon said, this is about one person at a time. It's about thinking about what people, what's important in their lives and what they want. So it's not about supporting people to live on their own. It's about supporting people to live with the people that they want to live with or that they love or that are in their lives. And that's what we did in this uh, in Jewish situation. So Jewish, um moved into his house and we at the time had, uh, through that process and through kind of some of the kind of safety and concerns that, that were around for most of the people, if not all of them, at that point, leaving the hospital, we had to provide 24 hours support. And uh, there was, we had to do a lot of work around, as you would expect, the risks and the concerns and strategies. We employed a very, very bespoke team and we actually had people in that team that Huey and his girlfriend, Margaret, knew. And um, were in, in their lives, we recruited it differently probably than, than uh, other other uh, organisations might have done at the time. 
and that made sense in terms of their relationships. Um, but we also still managed to have a very distinct two services being provided, even though both you and Margaret lived in the same house, they had two very separate and distinct uh, arrangements that were designed for them. Um, and then they moved out and uh, it went um, very quickly. Huey told us that actually the, the 24 hour support and everything that we were doing was like massively too much. And they kicked us out really, didn't they, Simon, very early on. Uh, um, and, and I suppose what happened then was we had, we had always known that, that Huey, as soon as we met him, was going to be somebody that had so much potential and wanted to do so much, but he was just accelerating the pace of what we thought we would be doing in terms of that planning with him. Um, and we worked with him to just help him learn how to manage some of the issues that he was dealing with over time. So Huey's going to speak now, but I just want to say Huey's been living in his own home now for 25 years. That independence is, you know, he's still somebody that um, I'm proud to say is in my life and a friend of mine that um, he is a, somebody who's got real interests, real drive, real dreams still for the future. And in terms of the support he gets, I think he only gets support at 20 hours a week three days a week or something, you might get support over the week. So there's many days and times when Huey's just getting on with his life now. And compared to the person that people had been worried about and anxious about and the kind of challenges that were recognised around Huey, then that is, you know, so far removed from what people probably expected. But I just think it just, re it reminds us that we're not doing this for the first time. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have masses of experience of where we've worked with people in this way and that it's worked so well to transform their lives. So I think we can hear from Huey now, that would be great. So John, do you want to unshare? Yeah. And Francis, you just mute. Okay. Um. Dee, 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 dee. Sorry, everyone. Is that film gone? <laughs> oh, um, sorry about this. this. Is my fault. The there we go. Zoom. So it's great to have uh, Huey McIntyre uh, joining us uh, in this film. Uh, Francis and I met Huey some 25 years ago to the north of Glasgow um, under the strangest of circumstances. And Fran, you're going to start just asking Huey some questions, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, Huey, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, um, how important was it to you to have your own home when you moved out of hospital? Um, very important in my life was to have my own, just to get out of the castle and have my own freedom and do things that I haven't done and starting to um, fit in with other people. And now that living in my house, it's just felt like I've got my own freedom that like I've always felt like this is my own place, I always like my own space and so I could then um, not to be picked on all the time and that, and it's, it's, it's been great. My life has absolutely changed. It's done my life. See, when you left hospital, um, you had quite a lot of support when you very, very first came out of hospital, do you remember? Um, and can you tell us a wee bit about how that's changed up until now? I remember the first time when I moved into the house I used to have sleepover with a staff called Les Dixon and Joanne and when they were staying over, sleeping over and I decided to stop the sleepover and let them go back home to spend more time with their family and, I, and that but they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to do that but they wanted to make sure that I would be okay with a sleepover and I said, and I said no, just go home your family and that and since that happened and then it started to change and that uh, I was more like put myself and trust myself to do 
what I can do. I know I used to have very bad tempers and angers and blaming other people for, for all that. And I never used to take my own responsibility for my way I reacted. But this, this, some stuff used to work with me, but didn't want to work with me because they were scared. But I remember what this said. This says that she's going to work with me and she's going to get me. She's going to be with me until she gets me on the track. And she always lets me calm myself down and all that. But things are changed now since I came out of that castle. Yeah, that's a long time ago, isn't it? And you yeah. get very, very little support. You know, from all that support you had then in the very beginning, and then really quickly you were saying, I don't want all this support. No. But, even, but even from then, Huey, yeah. the support you get now is really different again, isn't it? You don't get a lot of support at all now. Only about 25 hours. And I want to get Grant in on a Monday. Um, Grant in on a Monday and a Thursday. I don't have anybody on a Tuesday or a Friday or a weekend. But because Grant's leaving at the end of October, he's um, actually coming in on a Saturday now until... That, but that's, that's um, I don't know how it works now because um, one of the days I might not want any stuff coming in. I want to have time left at my own money again because it's all changed because of the, this lockdown and that. It was, it was putting a lot of pressure on me. And thanks for Grant for getting me up the Zoom meeting and that to keep in touch with my friends because if I didn't have that, I wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. It's amazing that you've been in that one house all yeah, those years since you left Lennox Castle, isn't it? Yeah, well, all, all by myself. I get coming at my door and ask me, if you want anything, don't hesitate. I'll come by and see if you want anything. And, and, and always, um, I get the police coming to my door to check on me. I get the, the, the social workers from the council phoning up to check on me to see if I'm, I'm okay, if I'm handling the lockdown, oh, and right. yeah. if I'm not distressed because of what's happening. I just tell them, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I just tell them, you don't need to keep going to check on me. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm 55 years old and I can look after myself. Yeah. <laughs> and what about some of the highlights and the things that you've done in the last few years? Because I know some of them and I've been lucky enough to be I mean, with you. Been, we, we were here occasionally, like when we went to New York. Oh, I am for my birthday in New York. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I loved that. I wish I went back there again. Uh, but I remember the good days when I, first, when I was in the castle. I met Emma, you, and Simon in the hospital grounds. And when I was upset, I ran out, and Emma took me out and brought me to the office. Inclusion, and that's when I first met Francis and Simon. And then I was kind of really upset, and Francis didn't like to see that in me because it was upsetting you, wasn't it, Francis, to see me being upset? Well, I even upset me, see, upset. Yeah, and that, so I was in the ward, and then next minute um, I got to help to pack my case and pack all my stuff. And I was like, what, going to another hospital? And he said, no, just pack the stuff. And see, when I went in the minibus and driving at the main gate, I was like, thank God to see the back of the place. But all of it was in my head, was thinking about the other people were still... Still there? Yeah, that I would try to get them out. I was, like, talking for them as well as myself and get them out. But... When I went out, people, the staff in the world were really nasty to me and said, oh, you'll be back in. I said, I don't bet on it. <laughs> don't bet on it. And then, and then when I, I was a bit scared because it was like, I remember saying this at the, when I first came out, when I went to Manchester, when I did the big conference, talking about this castle, Lance Castle, in front of all the students over there. And... I remember when I first came out, I was, like, scared because I didn't know where I was going to go to and I didn't know what the outside... Because I haven't been outside the gate. Because I didn't know what the outside world, world what, was, what it was going to be like, what the people were going to treat me like. Because I don't know if they were going to treat me nice or bad or whatever. And when I got out, 
some people did treat me bad, but I just turned a deaf ear and turned around and said to them, I said, I turned around and said to them right at their face, I said, maybe I am a freak, maybe I'm a, I've got learning disability, maybe I'm a spastic, but deep inside, I'm a person, I'm a flesh and blood human being, and I should be treated with respect. No people with learning disability should be treated the way you're treating me. And let me tell you something, if you were in the place, if you were in my shoes and been in the place where I've been in, you will be glad to get out of there. But I'm glad to get out because I'm wanting to start my new life in the community and make friends, not enemies. And, and, and they all apologised. And I said that because it was, I just want you to be normal. I, I can't help having a disability. So I was born with it. Oh, that was very powerful from Huey, I think. And uh, mm. I remember, uh, I think one of the first times I went to the castle to help Huey develop a plan, one of the first things he said to me was, I'm not having that woman in the room, pointing to one of the nurses on the ward. And that was one of the challenges of respecting people's human rights was sometimes you had to, and, and that, but obviously it's challenging when the system's saying, but you know, this, it's the staff's planning that's important. Um, just as I hand back over, a couple of the questions, so I don't think you need to respond to this immediately, but maybe think about it. I think people are thinking that maybe uh, this is just for people who are quite able, and so people are, don't realise that our work has been with people with severe intellectual impairments, autism, people with physical disabilities. So just to bear that in mind, perhaps, guys, when you're talking through the next section. Uh, so back to Francis, I think. I think it's back to John, isn't it? I guess, yep. Uh, I can find the right place to start here. Yeah. And yeah, so that was very powerful and a powerful kind of insistence on uh, here we are. Powerful insistence on uh, Huey's own humanity. Um, so with that in mind, I think that gives us our bearings for 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 the, the bit that comes up next. Um, and we will touch on the, the question that's just been raised by, by, by Simon there through the chat. Um, what the book is trying to do then is to bring a basic humanity, a, a strong insistence on, on human rights and, and best practice to bear on the issue of dislocation, segregation, separation. Um, and what, what the, the, the rest of the book consists of is really just the, some of the tried and tested tools that people have used over the years um, to help people think about their lives, think about what, what they'd like to be doing in their lives, think clearly about the kind of support they need going forward, and also to kind of tie together the, the interagency multidisciplinary working that's often required, particularly for the folk who um, are, have, have, have the, the most severe disabilities. So this first section, uh, following on from, from the, 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 the getting our bearings part, this, this is really um, about person-centered planning. So it's about painting a picture or devising, uh, in John O'Brien's words here, a compelling image of a desirable future and working to think about how you would invite people to join you on the journey to make it happen. Um, so if you're starting out in this journey, it's because in the past you've been moved away from your family and community, you're some distance from home, you need to have some idea of what the future might hold for you. So this person-centered planning activity is about uh, reclaiming, I suppose, a picture of what the future might look like that includes home and community and family. Um, and the, these are the sorts of things that, that that picture might include. And all very 
basic and familiar to lots of people in this meeting today, I'm sure. Um, interestingly, however, we were in a, a, a similar kind of session a few weeks back where one of the participants said to us at the end, you know, a, a psychiatrist working in the system said that she, she had never encountered the, the, the degree of personalization and person-centeredness that's gone into, you know, that, that's described here. Uh, being evidenced in, in, in the work that, that she was connected to in terms of folk uh, moving on from, from hospital. So it seems old hat, it seems common sense, uh, but it also seems a lot of the time we're, we're still not doing it or not doing it properly. Um, the second section then is uh, the vehicle. And in this, this chapter really thinking about how people take control of the journey home and the context for that has for us has been self-directed support um how which which vehicle do you want to choose to take you on the journey and um, I think again, very often people think, well, it's 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 deinstitutionalization. It's uh, moving folk out of hospital. Surely you you wouldn't bring self-directed support into that. Um, so one of the contentions of the book is, yes, yes, you do. You just work through this kind of thing as you would in any other kind of situation, and you give people the chance to think about um, which option they would like to take and how much control that they or perhaps their family would like to, to have in relation to the service that's going to be designed. So in a Scottish context, up in the top left corner there, we now have four options for self-directed support, which are contained within our legislation, um, uh, with, with what everyone would understand as direct payment as option one, uh, option two relating to individual service funds in the main, uh, option three being the traditional care management route and option four being a mixture of uh, options one, two and three. So that's the context we work within um, here in Scotland, or at least it is the context that we should be working in, um, but it's not always applied or not always ap apply, applied properly. One of the emphases of our work is that it's, it's helpful for people to know in advance what budget they're working with, how much money is available for this uh, before uh, getting involved in, in, in the planning stage. So that, that uh, upfront publication talks about that. Um, rather than doing it the other way around where you come back with a, a wonderful plan and somebody says, well, we can't afford that. So um, what, what can be afforded and how do we get the most out of the funding that can be afforded is a key principle here. And the, the slide in the middle is to do with a publication that Francis and Sam Smith um, produced a few years back, which is really about our option two, how, how individual service funds could be applied in the system. And on the right hand side, you'll see the kind of the four characteristics which for us would constitute um, an individual service fund. How do I know that I've got an individual service fund? Well, these four things would hold true. I'd have an upfront, upfront budget. Uh, my, my support could be deployed flexibly. I have, would have as much control as I want to have, but the overriding focus would be on the quality of my life and the, the positive outcomes for a good life that are, are being pursued. So building that in together with the, the person-centered plan, moving on to self-directed support, and then coming to what we've called in the book, the route map. And this is to do with uh, support planning and service design and gets into some of the real nitty gritty nuts and bolts of the, the discharge process and, and what's involved in it. It needs to contain everything you and others need to know to make sure you're able to lead a full and meaningful life back home. And the sort of things that we're, we're, we're thinking about here are, where are you gonna live? And how will, we, how will we ensure that that place you live is not just a, 
a building, but it's actually a home. It's homely. It's a place where you're at ease and have comfort and privacy. If you're going to live there, what kind of help will you need? And then you, you, we can go th through the usual kind of checklists of the type of support that people might need. Um, and who's going to help? Who's going to help you with that support? And what kind of money are you going to have to live your life? Some of the, the basic components that would go into to service design. I think the next slide really touches on the question that was raised there after, after Huey's video. It's, it's to do with the people that you think this could never apply to. It's that, yeah, okay, th this is fine for some people, but it's not for everybody. And our, our insistence here is this, this is universal. And Mansell's insistence was, this is universal. Everyone um, is entitled to and can benefit from um, uh, uh, their own home and their own community-based service that supports them whatever the degree of challenge or disability might be. Our feeling, and this, this relates to some work that we've been doing in this area recently, that these kind of issues that we've, we've listed here seem to be key components for making sure that it is universal and can be applied to everyone. Um, so there needs to be strong leadership that understands and holds true to the values that we've been speaking about earlier on understands it's universal, that, that, that this is for everyone, and that that leadership is allied to a particular expertise in relation to behavioral issues or personal care issues. It's a job for experienced people, and experienced people who are following person-led strategies to make sure that people get home safely and from from that base then can live a, a fulfilling life. There needs to be specific training for members of staff. And because it's a difficult job sometimes, a demanding job, um, then there, there, there needs to be really sensitive support for the people who are doing this work. Not a, in addition, you know, obviously folk need to be better remunerated and rewarded for doing the work that they do than, than they maybe currently are. Um, and another key component we think in this bit is that an intelligent use needs to be made of non-recurring resources. So what it takes to get you out of the hospital in the first instance may not be what's needed in the long run. But that front loading of the finance, which ensures that the, you know, the, the plans and the service is robust at the outset, is really important. Um, and, and, and a key part of, of the service design. Final part then, passport. Um, this is really about the responsibility of all the agencies involved to work. And, and again, particularly for the folk who um, are the more, you know, the more disabled end of the spectrum, unless we have multidisciplinary person-centered teamwork, then the person's very likely to um, fall between a number of stools when they come back home, whether it's through um, the politics of interprofessional rivalry or poor communication, um, or people really not being signed up to think that this can work, or uh, people really not being focused on the person so much as their own agency. So that's a really, really important issue. And you know, part of the safe journey home requires in advance that people are coming together and signing up to that kind of partnership. Um, yeah. So you might have something like the care program appro approach, you might not, but the, 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 for, for people, for some of the people um, in, in ATUs and places like that, you may, you may need that kind of level of um, what would you say, sort of formal partnership, whatever binds everyone together in, in, a, in a formal undertaking. But even if you don't have that, there still needs to be that sense of partnership and commitment to the individual and, and to the whole person. So that's the theory. And now Francis is going to take us through the theory as it, it works itself out in relation to 
um, a particular person called Callum. Yeah. So I get all the good jobs talking about introducing these fabulous folk. Um, and <clears throat> I think it is an interesting um, question that's been recently been raised about this only being um, something that you can do when people are more able or it's for, you know, um, for people who couldn't take um, more control over certain parts of their lives. Or <clears throat> it's definitely um, really interesting if you were to meet somebody who um, Huey had, you know, kind of been involved with many, many years ago, um, because I think he had one of those reputations that was extremely uh, challenging. And he had been in other places, and we worked with lots and lots of people where uh, they had actually been in other um, supported living or group homes and that had failed and had been readmitted to hospital. Um, with, you know, Huey is an, an example of seeing somebody 25 years down the line, and I think that's why we wanted him to join us today, to, to be able to kind of let people see what's possible. Um, but Callum's story is equally inspiring. So, um, but one of the things that we face all the time is that when we do this work, over and over again, people will say, yeah, well, that, that is, I see what you're saying, but not for the person I'm talking about. That person's too challenging or this will be too difficult. And I suppose what we're saying is, as John said, is that's not the case. And it is about designing what makes sense for each individual and for each person. And that might mean that some people may need a lot of support for a long period of time. But it's also about having a vision for the future for them and not just assuming that everything stays the same. And I think that can be a real um, error in a way in terms of designing services. If you just design everything based on where people are at right now, when they're not actually living in a home, when they're living away in a a, a, a place which is often not even within a community setting, um, where you know nothing really is, as Huey described actually, is 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 familiar to them or uh, a, you know uh, a world that they understand. And um, so you're expecting that that piece of work that you're doing things are going to change dramatically. And I think with that person, you want to be trying to really change and and plan for that right from the start, rather than doing stuff that then you have to keep on picking. I mentioned, Simon mentioned that at the beginning, and I think that can be a, a challenge, but I think it's really possible, and we've been able to do that many, many times, where we really help people think forward, but do that in a very, very safe way. Callum's a great example, I think, of this in, in his story. So, um, Callum, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's not actually Callum, I'm glad to see under that. But it is a, an example of how Callum probably felt when we first met Callum because um, he was a young man who had, and he will tell you in his own words again in a moment with uh, him and his mum and, and a film about how he felt about the support he was getting. But it was one of those situations where things just seemed to keep escalating and the more that things escalated, the more he challenged and the more that he challenged the more support was put in and things escalated to the point where he actually ended up in an out of area, not an out of area, it was out of country, he was actually in a, 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 a unit down in England where his family lived up here. Um, so that sense sometimes of the resources, and it's not just the resources of money, but the resources of trying to support people when things are challenging always in that way can feel quite overwhelming for people. And that's how Sir McCallum described it. Um, the next slide, John. So we met Callum on his journey and, and I know that we've described the different aspects of um, the journey home. And we've said, you know, obviously it'd be nice if it was all in a line, it's never in a line. <laughs> You, you might start somewhere and then you're going back to things. So we started with Callum. Um, we were working with an organisation, actually, we were doing a lot of work with that organisation around self-directed support. And, um, but Callum came to that organisation because he had returned um, from a placement down in England. He had a placement where he had a, a flat, but was sharing a lot of the support uh, with other people, but had one-to-one -one support and sometimes two-to-one support. 
but was that still was absolutely not working for him. He was very stressed, distressed, was continuing to challenge. And I was asked to go and help work with the people within the organisation to design the service around Callum. So it was about going in, planning with him, thinking with his family and people that knew him and thinking about that move from where he was over to the, the organisation that was going to be providing support. So the planning started there. And I remember going in with the people... Um, that I was working alongside and, and meeting Callum and his family and, and we did um, a, we did a, a, a path in the room and what I would say was that path at that point in time was really, really interesting because we got so much information, so much clues and the reason I've got these three boxes up here is because what happens a lot in these situations and this is in my experience and I'm sure lots of people who uh, our hero will, will share that experience is that we get very stuck on the risk issues. So the, the fact that this person's very challenging, that they've been in specialist unit, that people are really worried about their well-being, and, and, and that is absolutely valid and really, really important. But we also, I think, if we can, continue to see those other bits which are highlighted in there. He's, a, he's got a great family. He's a very loving son. He lo he's got loads of things he loves doing. He actually, and this was one of the biggest clues, he had a job, his mum worked in a day service, she actually ran the day service, and he came and worked there. And Callum, when he was there, was loved by everybody and was a totally different person when he was in a different role within that, day, that, that job that he had. And so in the middle of all of this chaos and concern and uh, obviously challenges that were, that were happening and the change that we were trying to uh, think through with him, there was just this massive clue <laughs> that actually if he sees himself as some in a different way and uh, we get it right that this person, you know, was telling us uh, within that, that that life could be very, very different for him and we needed to get that right. So um, we, we started that planning process and Callum moved to his own home. So he moved to his own home. He, 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 at this point, he didn't have self-directed support as such. He had his own team. He had one-to-one uh, -one support at all times. He had two-to-one support at times. And that cycle of kind of that not working and challenging and him needing actually be readmitted to a hospital and uh, continued, even though we worked really hard, we did lots of strategy work, uh, we had lots of things in place and we had all of the staff and resources to go in there when it was needed. But actually, it wasn't still working for Callum. Um, so we continued to do that work together. And it took us probably a good bit longer. Um, John, maybe go to the next one, I think. Before we started to really get everybody um, on the same page in terms of saying, right, maybe we could do something different here. Maybe we could use the creativity around self-directed support. Maybe if we do listen and focus in a different way, maybe this young man in certain ways is over-supported and is trying to tell us that, which is a very scary thing, I think, at times to, to um, work together on when things are in crisis. So it, we, we got to that stage about 18 months after we first met Callum, before we all got on the same page and said, let's do something different. So that collaborative working, uh, we were working together, but we all got to that same page. We all agreed that we needed to do something different. And at that point, I think, um, and this is just a picture of a plan and process that we can use, but it's a really kind of trying, as I said earlier, to move away from what's not working to what matters and do that as well as holding all of that uh, work that you have to do around being robust and having structures in place and keeping people safe. So there's a real shift that needs to happen um, and using the money to help people get a good life. So if we move on to the next slide, then this kind of shows us, I'm gonna let Callum speak and we'll come back to this slide, but this shows us kind of how the plan then ended up working out for Callum because he was being listened to. Um, and over time, the support that he needed was reorganised dramatically. But I think they'll hear from Callum and his mum and then come back and maybe talk a wee bit more about what actually happened.
good and sound. Apologies, just give us a, a, a few seconds to work out what's happening with the film. We did try all of these things earlier on. <laughs> The controls, the sound, the sound, the sound controls, Francis, are at the end of the uh, that little bar. You see that at the other end. Can you um, see? Oh yeah, like this one. At the other end, yes, exactly. I I, I could hear, I could hear. Well, could, is it just me that can't hear them? I don't know. Could you hear it, Simon? Could we ask the audience? <laughs> try try it again. I think maybe. Um, we'll put two of them because we're two. Yeah. We'll enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I like music and Xbox and Snooker. And I'm all doing driving lessons as well. Callum's whole life has been one exclusion after another from special needs school, from respite, um, school minibus. Some of the kid I was off a high power and and now my man I used to buy them over a lot and smash things, but now I'm stop doing that so now it's all changing my life, which is good. Somebody said there could be a possibility of Cam getting a house at some foundation. And at the beginning, everything was going okay, he had 24 hour, seven day a week support. Um, occasionally there was two, two to one support. Um, but that was mainly because of the history that was coming with Callum and the belief that that's what he needed. Um, quite soon it became, you know, that Callum was, seemed to be reverting back to the old ways of becoming challenging. I actually hated it because I was following the non-stop, kind of back and forward, back and forward. With um, the Thistle team and Francis Brown, we started really looking at his individual service fund and how what Callum's life could look like, how he wanted it to look. Very quickly, Callum was saying that one of, you know, if you could change anything, Callum, what would it be? And he kept saying, I want people to listen to me. And of course, everybody was saying, well, we are, we are. And he says, but nobody hears what I'm saying. Everybody was really trying to make Callum's decisions and make his choices for him because we all thought this is what he wanted, this is the best. And then Cal said, I don't want staff in my face all the time. So how, would, how, how what's the first step, Cal? I don't want anybody sleeping in my house. I like, I would want to be in my house on my own. I expected all these phone calls through the night to say, oh, I'm not wanting this, I don't like it. But no, and he's, he's he managed really well and we phoned in the morning to say I enjoyed that. Um, and that's what I wanted. Um, and then I've just never looked back since then. So I'm getting less, less support, I'm getting less and I'm on sleepovers now, so I'm on space here, which is good. Well, his whole package reduced down to 27 hours a week, um, which, for, what I, you know, for Callum, you know, that was fantastic. It gave us a huge pocket of money to think a wee bit more creatively with, and Callum fully bought into it and came up with all these things that we didn't, they know about, or, or we knew he had interest in things, but didn't know that he actually had um, real ambitions to do stuff. I was talking about um, car vacuum business, working cars and stuff. Well, I was kind of wanting to be a mechanic, kind of working on engines and cars and stuff. Um, I like getting messy hands there, so I mean, I'm glad to move on to the um, My dream car is going to be a thrill. I like to get a bit on, but what's the point of having a big guy if you can only go at a certain speed? So, I'm glad for one of the ones in Twilight. His weight was was one of his biggest things, and you know, he, his general well being, and you know, his cousins and his slim things. So he wanted to be like him, and he wanted to be like the guy from Twilight. And um, he asked that one of the things he could have would be a personal trainer. Yeah, weightlifting, running, jogging, uh, press ups and sit ups, and that and just pushing through the pieces. <laughs> yeah, I was, but um. Three stone. So I just get a lot of support with all the thistle. You know, all that funding is going to things like car business and personal trainers and cleaners and stuff. So that's what I want, eh? So, um, yeah. Uh, I think that there needs to be more publicity on what it means to people 
and what they can, what they can do with that. They get you several places where Callum's there to help him tell his story. And I think after the, the sessions are over, the feedback that he gets from people coming up and saying, that's really good, you know, that's made me think. I think it's a good thing because so the people I've just met like, have got the problems as well, just like me. It gives them a good idea, like, how they can change their life as well. It has changed Callum's life, there is no doubt about it. If we were still sitting with him sitting in here with 24 hour support, well, Callum wouldn't be here, I wouldn't imagine. It wouldn't be a life for him, or, you know, he wouldn't get, you know, he wants to keep achieving, he wants to keep learning. He's, he's his own man, he's living here, he cooks for himself, he cleans for himself, he goes about his business himself, he doesn't need me to make his choices or decisions for him. Um, and that's great, that's the best thing, I'm just so proud of him. I want to do a lot of things because places are holiday, I have never been for it. I've been to Newcastle because the family's in there. I want to go somewhere back in New York, take pictures, come back, frame it. So I've never seen ever. It was always hopes and dreams. See what money, get a passport, and just go for it. It's more. It's for the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's Callum's uh, and Moira, his mum, talking about their um, life and some of the things that they then went on to do. Um, the work that we did together at that time, I suppose, is, was, again, it, as John mentioned, it's that real collaborative working together. So we had to um, get everybody that, to, to kind of agree how we were going to manage those risks that, that people were really concerned about when we started to make those changes. But I would say one of the things about the planning and the work that we did and really trying to listen and understand what Callum wanted was rather than him feeling that he was losing things or taking things away from him or that was too scary, we were spending equally the amount of time really thinking about what does a good life look like and what are those things, how do we help him really get into that space where he feels that he um, doesn't have that reputation any longer because that's actually one of the reasons he was obviously challenging so significantly because he just was felt very stuck in this uh, place with all the uh, feeling very pleased feeling very uh, smothered by the support. So, but I think without one thing, the other thing would be much harder to achieve for Callum as well. Um, money wasn't an issue. The, everybody was really keen that the budget, which was a substantial budget, was kept in place because even though we were all on the same page, people were still saying, we don't want that money to disappear and then can't get it back because it's gone somewhere else in the system. So everybody agreed that there was no change in his budget until we were confident in a year, two years time that things were significantly different. And, 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 that, and when things did get tough, it was about being flexible and thinking about different ways to respond to, for Callum. So having that ability to, for somebody to come in and do what he needed at, in that moment on call. Um, and also just building relationships with all sorts of people around about him. So, um, there was a neighbour and we did at one point talk about employing a neighbour and maybe having that person as part of the team because we got in this neighbour and we resisted that and I think that, that was really, really important because that neighbour uh, became a friend and when Callum now, which is seven years on, so this is still, you know, again, considerable success from Callum's point of view and everybody's point of view in terms of continuing to go in the direction of Callum's independence, but when he needs somebody to talk to and he gets upset, he goes and calls in his neighbour and they go for a walk. Um, and if we'd have paid them, that might have, again, changed those relationships and wouldn't have created those real relationships that he has. Um, so he does have a small team. He does have hours which he gets direct. But he also has hours which he can call on and use. One of the significant things about planning and helping people do things the same way as the rest of us would, when we sat the very first time we met, Callum and we asked him about things like um, his mum talked there about his weight and going to the gym and Callum did as well and Callum was very very clearly saying eh, I want to lose weight and I want to go to the gym there was a gym actually on the site where he lived right beside him and he had staff and they would try and take him and encourage him but it became a totally different thing when he had his own personal trainer 
when that was actually funded, um, rather than having a support worker do that. And he still has that relationship seven years on with his personal trainer. He still, you know, apart from obviously lockdown, he's been doing it through Zoom and he's got uh, weights and various things in his house at the moment. But those are the kind of significant shifts that when, we, when somebody gets a chance to do it in an ordinary way, can make to their uh, self-esteem and the way that they engage. And he just completely engaged with that in such a different way because it wasn't a support worker and it wasn't a member of a team who was also trying to struggle with him, I would imagine, to do things like help him, you know, think about how, you know, how he was feeling. The other thing that was as part of, it was really interesting, but part of what, what Callum was saying is he needed help with his anger. And we actually asked as part of the, um, the package that you get counselling, um, and that came back, you know, within his support, that was one of the things that people were kind of struggling with um, because they were feeling that he should be able to get that anyway, but he really hadn't. For all the time that, you know, he'd been in uh, the system, he was saying, I'm, I don't, I need help to work this stuff through myself. I need help to talk to somebody. And, and we did get the go ahead in the end, we agreed together collectively, that would be something that would make sense for him. Um, so even after coming back and saying, no, I'm not, we're not sure, we went back and we had the discussions and we worked those things through together. So it's a brilliant piece of collaborative working as well. When things get tough, see the, the hugging there and the, the, um, the rugby uh, scrum. I mean, there's, there's a real sense that that, that feels like, a, that actually sometimes it can feel that you need to actually do that, hold on really tight at those times where you're getting challenged to think, well, maybe this isn't going to work and we need to really be very, very clear and not go back to just having the response as resources of people and actually keep trying to work out what it is we might be getting wrong and what this person is telling us and do that in a way that we don't blame each other and we learn from it. And that's, I think this was an example of where that worked so well because this young man had a massive reputation um, again, and if, if we just continued to be supported and these other things, self-directed support had to come in, he wasn't in control, then I think that he would have, that would have continued and he would continued with a, a very large package of support and a, and a large reputation. Yeah, that's me talk, talking about Callum. So you want to finish your... Yeah. I'm mindful of time, guys, as well. We've got 15 minutes until the end. Very quickly then, just to end on a note of challenge, it's all very well for us to come, you know, and talk about uh, positive stories of success. Um, and there's, there's all the people who, who have managed to come home. There's all the people who never were sent away in the first place. But there's still far too many people who, um, who whose stories are really distressing. Um, and we, certainly we intend to use the, the publication with our own government. Um, and we started to do that to, to ensure that the people that we know about in our society um, are assisted to, to, to make the journey back home. So th the challenge really is um, one of accountability. Um, one of Jim Mansell's quotes was, uh, the real solution is to stop using these kinds of places altogether. Who will hold local health and social services to account to make that happen? So our challenge really is to each one of us, to ourselves as, um, and the different roles that we occupy in life, just as people or as citizens or as professional people. Um, the accountability rests with us to, to a large extent, and we also have some sort of responsibility to hold others accountable, whether it's politicians or, or whoever, for making sure that uh, we stop using these kind of places and that we ensure that the people who already live in them do come home. So, oh, one final slide. It's just Francis and I operate under the guise of Radical Visions, that's our contact details there, um, and we'd be delighted if you got in touch and um, we took the dialogue further. Thank you.
Thank you, John. Thank you, Francis. I'm going to put us on the uh, so all, and that that was fantastic. And uh, we didn't even go too far over time. And some of the uh, going over time is my fault. I think just wittering on at the beginning and then losing Huey's film. Um, so I think we've got 12 minutes. It's good to kind of finish on time. Um, the so. My observation about some of the questions is is a couple of those that you've touched on a little bit, but uh, there were some questions about because they hear Callum's story and Hugh Huey's story, and I guess we all know this, don't we? People always go, oh, there's somebody else who this personalised approach doesn't fit for. So there's that kind of query that I think some people have, which uh, we might want to speak to. And the other one is, the, I guess, that financial one, the other kind of... Um, false assumption is somehow doing the right thing is more expensive than doing the wrong thing um, as we know of course you can I guess you could strip everything away but reality in practice I think has largely been that the wrong thing is more expensive mm -hmm. than the right thing but you might want to touch on that both of you I suppose the third question more generally picking up on your last point John um, is yeah, like, why are we so stuck? You know, we right at the beginning of this, we, you know, I was talking about conversations we were having in, I think it was about 1993, John, when we first met. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's a long time ago now, isn't it? That's the whole of a 30-year career where we're saying, hey, do you know what? Maybe we need to treat people as individuals right from the beginning. And maybe we need to design our systems so that happens. Um you know, there, it's, it's possible to point to progress and even things like this webinar today perhaps are symptoms of that, but it still feels like we've got, you know, m a long way more than half of the way to go to get to where we know is possible. So I don't know whether just like one or two minutes each and then we'll kind of reflect back. You might want to just reflect on some of those kind of hurdly type questions. I think on that last point, I. It seems to me that people are people who work in the system are often not convinced of the values and principles we debated at the beginning. Um, and whatever, I mean, we've all come across people, uh, would be colleagues, who would say the most um, disabling things about people or devaluing things. People in senior roles in organizations that we, we've worked in. So if your fundamental mindset is, is of that nature, then you're not gonna follow through on this. You're not, going to, you're not going to have basic assumptions that people are, you know, this person's just like me, he just needs the same sort of, you know, people who, who have no language, people who have very challenging behavior. Why, why should I make that assumption? I don't, you know, I don't believe it, or, or even at an unconscious level, it seems that that that, that people, uh, they may pay lip service to it, but you know, deep down they may uh, not 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 carry that through. So I think that's one of the reasons for the historical thing, why it's so slow and why it's so difficult and why it's always a challenge and and you know, devaluation, I suppose, is the is the theoretical term for it, isn't it? You know, the, 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 that devaluation of people gets carried right into the midst of the services that we, we work in. It's not just a thing in society. On the money front, um, I don't think there is any evidence that it's cheaper to, to group people together. Um, we certainly don't want to be making claims it's cheaper for people to live in their own communities either. Um, it's just about how we spend the money that we've got. Uh, I think also, I mean, our, we have a recent review of adult social care document, which is saying we need to stop thinking of social care as a burden. And we need to think of it as something that we need to invest in because ultimately all of us rely on, on that system um, or could do or who knows what's around the corner for any of us. So that, that universal sense again, that you know, if we're building a system which is just for these strange people that we don't often encounter in our lives, then it's gonna crumble and fall. But if we're building a system for our, ourselves, it needn't, be, it needn't be more expensive, but we need to, 
we need to see it as, as a positive thing that we, we spend money on good service, on, on good practice, as we touched on earlier as well. Yeah, I think as um, John said earlier on, <clears throat> um, it's it's almost a mistake to see to think about this one person at a time. I think it's not a mistake to do it one person at a time. But if you only think about the finances around somebody like Callum and then don't think about the finances around somebody who maybe needs a lot more support for a lot longer. Now, if we didn't get it right for Callum, then we'd still be spending a lot more money or he would be in a place that's costing an awful lot more. So the costs and the, the and doing this well is about a much broader kind of expectation that if we get it right, then the costs continue to be more affordable. Um, not cheap, but more, you know, and I think that the reality is it's got to be one person at a time. And what I do think, Simon, and I would say this, and I'd say it all the time, and we put it in the book, I think the problem is that oftentimes people are planning and budgeting for the moment that people are in crisis and the moment of transition, instead of really thinking about what's possible for the future. And if we started to really look the way that we did, which was we don't expect the funding to stay the same in a year's time, in two years' time, because we know how well people do when we get it right. It shouldn't have to stay the same where people we might need to put, put big, robust services around some people to bring them out of these places where they've been, but it's a journey. And that journey should be funded in a way that has an expectation that the cost will go down because we know that it does. And so we should be looking at that and then costing the bits in between as a one-off cost, as a transition, really to get people from there to there. And the other thing that if we stop creating these places and actually do the work in our communities, when I mean, we've worked, we, we still get the pleasure of going in and working with lots of people and lots of families. And we've worked with, you know, where families are strong, where their ch children might have been sent to one of these out of uh, area placements and adult treatment unit or, and because the family is saying, no, that's not going to happen. There's a lot of money and support and resource goes into that. So nobody's saying that that person wouldn't be getting what they need. But again, we would be helping that person think, what does it look like in two years' time? What will it look like in three years' time? And doing that collaboratively so that you're not expecting to still be paying £250,000, £300,000 for a service in three years' time. You're actually paying something very, very different because it's working and we know that it does work. I've gone in and worked with the services after uh, people have been one, getting 2 be one support for years and years and years to try and help unpick that. And so if we, and, and it's much harder to do because we've not been thinking about it right from the start. It's much, much uh, better to do it that way and to think about all of those other things about people getting a good life as well and using the money more creatively and not just about the risks and the staffing and concerns. So that's my thought about money. Yeah, it strikes me. It reminds me very much of, um, you're obviously one of our friends from the past was Peter Kinsella. Yeah. One of the things we saw in when there's been good developments has been genuine strategic thinking, of course, and John was leading that too in Glasgow, but yeah. that's that feels like it's lacking these days. A kind of a kind of big picture understanding of what we need to change at, at multiple levels, mm -hmm. of which then the individual package is just one component. Yeah. And yeah, no, I def I mean, actually this morning, I was bizarrely, I was rung up by a BBC journalist asking about the, what the problems around the Winterbourne Review process and the problems of transforming care. And I was trying to explain to him, and it, it is challenging, the, the kind of conflicting incentives built into the system where people are effectively exported from their own neighborhoods into different systems with different priorities and and then you create these perverse barriers to people's inclusion because ultimately particularly local authorities find that who are being very badly treated by the english local government by english central government kind of quite understandably are saying well we don't want to take responsibility for this person so that strategic understanding is fractured by bad and incoherent structures um, um, but also I think that commissioners have not been encouraged 
since the 90s really to to get a kind of coherent understanding of what's really going on what the big picture is where we're really is has been a little bit too much functional behavior i think just like let's yeah. run the like it's like a process let's do the procurement yeah. things again and that 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 isn't how anything good ever happened. And that part of that strategic approach and, and local approach is about building capacity locally. Because as soon as you start saying we haven't got the, the resources here or the, the, the skills or whatever in this community and that person goes there, yeah. it's every opportunity. There's an opportunity with every person to say, how do we build it? What, what providers are around? What people are around that would be really you know, keen to get there? That there's skills around this person and work out how to do this collectively and, and let's do that instead of doing <laughs> just then to the person being continuing to have a, a deficit of skills and capacity in, the community. in, in <laughs> England. Sorry, John, you want to say something? Well, I'm just going to say, I, th I think we're very aware that the, there's a pattern of people uh, leaving institutions, the, the closure, the hospital closure program. There's a so traffic going in one direction. But yet, at the same time, people going in the opposite direction. And it's like the left hand not knowing what the right hand's doing, uh, people not sharing skills and experience and knowledge, um, or people uh, just deciding to do it anyway, because it's, 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 a, it's a simpler commissioning task, perhaps. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm noticing Chris Watson leads the Centre's work on self-directed support in England. And I think where he, things seem to be going more positively is in relation to kind of actually seeing this as kind of an investment in neighborhoods, which is some of the themes that Francis was just touching on. Um, and we, we last, at the end of last year, we've cr we created the neighborhood democracy movement as part of Citizen Network. And I think one of the messages, I think maybe one of our things we need to change is, is not just talk to services, but talk to neighborhoods. Um, because actually, at one level, this is also the theft of people and resources from neighbourhoods, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We're actually, there's actually a kind of bizarre privatisation and destruction of neighbourhood capacity when we send somebody with a disability out of their neighbourhood, put them in privatised care, which then send, sends the money into the pockets of wealthy people or often sends it overseas. But where's the... I mean, it's not so much the money, it's the learning, it's the relationships, exactly. it's all the, all the good things that could be happening in and around that person's life are lost. And, and so maybe we need to be ourselves more mindful of not just this kind of ongoing battle to get services to change, but, but also to change our own thinking, to, to look sideways at um, the communities that we are operating in. Um, the, uh, maybe like we're just over time, so maybe John and Francis, maybe John then Francis, a last word for the audience of people having to head off a wee bit now. So what would be your last kind of message? For me, it is, um, I think accountability, I, I suppose because it's 25 years later uh, from Lennox Castle and because things are still pretty bad, um, I think accountability is the big issue. We need to really step up, I think, as professional people and say, you know, the, you know I'm not going to collude in this anymore. I'm not going to participate in, in this anymore. And as citizens, yeah, we, just, we, need to, we need to push our politicians and our political parties to adopt uh, better policies. Thanks, John Francis. Yeah, I think I can. I think um, the same, really, that we should just stop doing it. I just don't think it's that bit of it is so easy if we just made it in Scotland, you know, just talk about Scotland for a start. We could just stop doing it, couldn't we? Yeah. As building these places, stop sending people away, and for each person, start a different approach, which is about building capacity around that person where they are and then the communities, and we would learn so much about that person and we would develop our skills so quickly if we, if we weren't forced to do that, if we didn't just keep going to these default positions and rebuild, rebuilding the institutions, which we're doing really. So I think it's, that's one fundamental thing to just say we're not doing anymore. 
we shut hospitals. We said, we, you know, we're shutting it and we did it. And people came out and we shut those places. Yeah. We should do the same with this. We should say no, no more. That's Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, John. Both really powerful, clear points.